This video is going to have two parts. The first part, which was written more or less entirely before the results of the 2019 UK general election came in, and this will do a breakdown of something that's overlooked in the 2017 UK general election. The second part of this video will have been written in response to the 2019 general election results. Don't worry, I'll clearly define when one part stops and the next one begins. Now on to the start of part one. In a way, this video is a spiritual successor to the previous video I did that showed the surprising amount of support that Bernie Sanders has among the so-called professional managerial class, and is part of a larger view I have about leftist politics in what is soon to be the third decade of the 21st century. So the narrative that people have in their minds for what happened in the 2017 UK general election, if they know anything about it at all, is that despite a massive smearing campaign and internal sabotage, Jeremy Corbyn was able to lead a genuinely leftist political movement that garnered massive amounts of support from the young and traditional working class to stick it to the older, conservative-backing, middle-income managerial class. This narrative is half completely true and half completely false. Now, how can I say something like that to start out with, that election absolutely saw Labour riding a wave of mass youth support. In fact, age was the single most important determinant of how you voted in that election. Uh, more than gender, more than race, and even class. Now, upon mentioning the NRS social class system, to those of you who know what it is, I'll get a lot of flack. But it's not the only thing I'm relying on to look at how people voted based on class. And additionally, even a flawed survey system is capable of telling you a general trend. Even if it's wrong about the start and end points, chances are the direction is correct. Anyway, the youth vote was clearly on the side of Labour and the olds on the side of the Tories. Generally speaking though, not in all circumstances. It does need to be emphasized, however, as much influence as social class has on politics, as will be discussed here, the single most important factor is age. That's worth a video all on its own. But a good way to understand this is, the later your birth date, the minimum amount of wealth you'll need to insulate yourself from climate change throughout the rest of your life only rises higher and approaches infinity. There is a similar situation when it comes to your ability to enter the housing market. Anyway, the support of the youth part is completely true. The part that is utterly false is the idea that labor rode a wave of traditional working class support. In fact, the there's evidence suggests that labor support was more middle class than ever before. Now, the easiest way to support this claim is simply by consulting NRS social system based polls. As you can see here, labor support is much more middle class than it was under peak Tony Blair times. And it is also notable that Corbyn won a larger share than labor has since 1997. I'm not just going to look at what polls say about how the traditional working class and the middle class voted. I'm going to get some other supporting evidence, starting here with looking at how the readership of the Financial Times voted. Labour did better with the readers of the Financial Times, an upper middle class to upper class paper if there ever was one, than it ever has. Despite the fact that the Financial Times endorsed Blair's Labour in the 2001 and 2005 elections, they can never get past 30% support from their readership, and the Tories never fell below 47%. Yet, in the 2017 election, when the Financial Times endorsed the Conservatives, Labour ended up in a statistical tie of 39 percent for Labour and 40 percent for the Conservatives. That's a giant swing. The last argument I'm going to look at is a short tale of two seats, Mansfield and Canterbury. Mansfield is a constituency that the Labour Party had held for nearly 100 years, from 1918 to 2017, with only a short interruption between 1923 to 1929. Yet, in 2017, Labour lost here. Why? Because the steadily growing strength of the anti-EU, anti-immigration forces, first bottled up in UKIP, were released into the Conservative Party support, and even as Labour's vote share went up 5.1 percentage points, the Conservatives made a whopping 18.4 percentage point gain. Labour's gain comes from the Greens not running a candidate and the Liberal Democrats losing around two-thirds of their support, but it wasn't enough. Meanwhile, a mirror story happened in Canterbury. Canterbury had been a Conservative seat since 1885, before there was even a Labour party. This seat has been home to massive Conservative double-digit victories, oftentimes with the Liberals finishing above Labour. Thanks to increased turnout and significant swing from both the Greens and the Liberals, Labour managed to win the seat by a tiny 0.3 percentage points in 2017. The reality is, in a wave election, Labour was able to gain an affluent Conservative safe seat 
while losing its own traditional working class safe seat. It is also notable that Canterbury is predominantly white, so this isn't the case of Labour riding upwardly mobile non-whites to a victory. It appears quite evident. At the very least in the UK, nativism is more important to the traditional white working class than the leftist economic policy is, and cosmopolitanism is more important to the middle income professional managerial class than any concerns about losing neoliberal meritocracy. End of part one. Senator Collins, thanks for coming in. It's a great pleasure, thank you. This ship that was involved in the incident off Western Australia this week... Yeah, the one the front if... fell off? Yeah. Yeah, that's not very typical, I'd like to make that point. Well, how is it untypical? Well, there are a lot of these ships going around the world all the time, and very seldom does anything like this happen. I just don't want people thinking that tankers aren't safe. Was this tanker safe? Well, I was thinking more about the other ones. The ones that are safe? Yeah, the ones the front doesn't fall off. Now you're going to hear two narratives for why Labour lost so much ground in the 2019 election. From media folks who don't know what they're talking about, and from extremely online leftists that don't know what they're talking about. The first mainstream narrative is that Labour lost because it went too far left. The second is that Labour failed to listen to the traditional working class in the North. Both are actually true, though not in the way these people mean it. Labour was too left-wing in the sense that it didn't commit to a nativist, policy of pro-removal of existing immigrants and barring of new ones, and it didn't listen to the traditional working class in the sense it failed to commit to doing that. Firstly, the only gain Labour made on the Conservatives in this election was in Putney, an affluent middle to upper income suburb that used to be a Conservative seat until a pro-Remain Conservative became an Independent. That Conservative didn't run again and split the votes as an Independent, by the way. A new Conservative ran, and they lost to Labour. As for the previously mentioned Canterbury seat, Labour went against natural trends there too and actually managed to both increase its voter share and increase the amount of votes they received, period. So no, Labour was wasn't too left-wing for the suburban middle class, even as it was utterly hammered in the media as being extremist and whatnot. As for the second narrative, I want to make two things abundantly clear. Firstly, this is not the northern traditional working class voting for Brexit because they're worried about the economic consequences of remaining EU. I cannot exaggerate how often and how annoying it is to watch people trying to say, well, you see, there are left-wing arguments for Brexit. All of the left-wing arguments for Brexit involve things that the conservatives are only going to do more of. I'm not even going to go into the history of the fact that every conflict that UK has had with the EU over workers' rights, it was the UK that was more anti-worker. I'm just going to focus on the fact that it should be blatantly obvious after nine years of conservatives and all those years of Thatcher that a normal conservative government is far more a danger to the conditions of the traditional working class than even a centrist Blairite New Labour government. Never mind a conservative government that's been angling to sell off the NHS to get a Brexit deal with the Trump-led USA versus a Labour Party that's absolutely loathed by wealthy media elite for having the most left-wing Labour program in arguably ever. Remaining with Labour is clearly better for the living conditions of the masses than leaving with conservatives. And worse yet, remaining wasn't even a surefire thing with Labour. Next year there would have been a referendum on Brexit in which case you get a Labour-led Brexit. What happened here is that these traditional working class Northern England voters, to impoverish themselves, because even if Labour did give them a Brexit, it would never be like the hard anti-immigrant Brexit that, that the Conservatives are offering. That's the one thing the pro-Brexit left, which is, as I'm going to explain in a bit, a marginal group is too delusional or duplicitous to admit. The next thing that the extremely online pro-Brexit left pushes is the idea that Labour centrists forced the party to adopt the second referendum as policy. Oh sure, centrists would like to believe that they had that power, but that's pure rubbish. The Labour membership, particularly those that elected Corbyn in the first place, is pro-Remain and pro-second referendum. If the centrists had the power to enforce their policies like this, they'd have long forced Corbyn to drop all of the vocally pro-Palestinian stuff and drop the nationalizations. But they didn't because they couldn't because the left is in control of the Labour Party. Just before this election, it leaked that John McDonald and a bunch of other shadow cabinet members not only wanted to campaign on a second referendum, but explicitly on being pro-Remain in that referendum. McDonald, the dude that smirks and stands his ground every time 
time some incredulous interviewer asks him about his comments on wanting to dismantle capitalism is not a labor centrist. In fact, what counts for centrism in the labor elite is very different from what counts for centrism in the labor membership. I bet very few people remember this, but back when Chuck Umana was still in the Labour Party doing wrecking, you know, before he thought he was the British Macron and, and started a breakoff party that failed, which lost all their seats, by the way, and that he ultimately left to join the Lib Dems. The Lib Dems lost his old seat and he lost his election as a potential new seat. But that's beside the point. Chuck's position immediately after the referendum was in favor of a Brexit that dropped freedom of movement with the EU. Why? Because real life Labour centrist members and voters were the ones that were more EU skeptical and he and the others were trying to position themselves alongside them. Eventually, he and others decided to side with the centrist elites instead of the centrist Labour membership and voters. Those particular centrists, by the way, also thought Labour's nationalizations might have gone too far, but would have tolerated it if they got the nativism they wanted in the first place. So where do we go from this? There's a whole lot to say, but it appears that the 2017 and 2019 UK general elections are telling us something. That the white traditional working class despises cosmopolitanism more than neoliberalism, and the white professional managerial class likes cosmopolitanism more than neoliberalism. This can be tempered by age. Younger people tend to be more cosmopolitan and older people less. But this principle generally checks out. Now you might have noticed that I largely ignored the effect of media smears here. I did that mostly because that is pretty much part of the built environment of politics in countries with rich people. They own the media and they say things that benefit their interests and honestly at the end of the day you can only really stop that by taking their wealth. Plus the same problems existed in 2017 and Labour did much better, and the people whose votes Labour lost are the type to distrust the media anyway. Is the situation hopeless in the short to medium term in the UK? It's looking pretty grim. But both of these elections provide plenty of lessons for the political left in the Western world at large, assuming it's willing to swallow the realities of what all this means, and rethinking how they view class politics, something that I'm going to continue looking at on this channel. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell and share.